Hello and welcome to our worship. Well, it seems that summer has finally arrived. Uh, the temperatures are increasing and after um, kind of intermittent showers and uh, rather chilly times we've had over the last uh, few weeks, we might actually have a few days when we can bask in the warmth of a British summer. So I hope you are enjoying it. And um, as I say, we're here coming towards the uh, middle of July and thinking about um, Jesus' call to his disciples and them reporting back. And I'll talk a bit about the Gospel reading in a minute um, when we get to um, our address. But welcome to our service. Let's begin with our opening responses. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. Blessed are you, Creator God, to you be praise and glory forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Our opening hymn today then is Christ is our cornerstone um, well-known hymn uh, originally written in Latin somewhere around the 9th century um, and then set to the tune of Harewood translated by John Chandler um, again one of these many Victorian um, English hymn writers Christ is our cornerstone on him alone we build with his true saints alone the courts of heaven are filled <laughs> The reading is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them, so I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, 
and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them, who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Picking up on the theme of shepherds then, we come to our second hymn, which is the setting of the 23rd Psalm, The Lord's My Shepherd. But we use the uh, Brother James air rather than the traditional tune Crimmond, um, because I think I quite like the tune. <laughs> it is, it's my video and I could choose, I suppose I could say. But actually, um, it's a lovely little lilting tune and repeating those last two lines of each verse uh, gives us a kind of a bit more of an impact, I think, when we think about uh, Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd to Brother James's air. taken from St Mark. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Let us all say, Glory to you, O Lord. This is from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. The apostles returned from their mission. They gathered around Jesus and told him all they'd done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. 
for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a, to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognised them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they'd crossed over, they came to land at Gen Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognised him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us say together, praise to you, O Christ. Jeremiah often gets a bit of a uh, undeserved reputation as a bit of a whinger, a bit of a moaner. Um, but if you do read through the book of the prophet Jeremiah, you can understand why people take that, uh, take that view. He has, a, he has a difficult job to do and it's not surprising when what he sees around him is, is destined for destruction, is coming to an end. It's not surprising that he has a go about all the things that are wrong with the society he's in, uh, the community, etc., etc. So we're going back to the time after King David, after Solomon, when the tribes of Israel are a bit disunited. There's lots of politicking and conflict going on. Um, Judah and Israel, the two, the two main parts of the of the of the tribe of, of Israel, have separated, and there's two capitals and two kings, and and all that that goes with that makes it a really tough time for being a prophet but actually Jeremiah has a message of hope because actually what he says to the people is actually the day of the Lord is coming when those who are unjust those who have um, uh, not looked after my flock those who scattered the sheep um, I will bring them back I'll bring a remnant back I will reunite them when I shall raise up a king who will be like David and he will bring righteousness and justice to the land and, and the days of Judah shall be saved and Israel shall live in safety. And, uh, and, and the name by which I, he will be called is the Lord is our righteousness. And again that goes back to that Old Testament understanding that by giving people names or naming things you have control over it. It's why... Um, for example, in uh, the, one of the creation stories, Adam is created first and the animals are brought in front of him and he names them to show he has dominion over them. Um, if you think about Isaiah, when he marries, he has children and he gives them names which would, you know, fill a modern day credit card and, and whatever, would cause all sorts of problems if they went to, <laughs> to primary school or secondary school. But actually, they are names that mean something to the people who hear them and the same is true here with Jeremiah the Lord is our righteousness is the name of the person who will be the king who will reunite God's people so actually although he does get a bit of a bad reputation Jeremiah is being here the purveyor of hope in the midst of confusion and changing symbols and changing politics and of course that's why I guess he speaks so well to our own times we're in the midst of some very difficult situations aren't we there are competing forces not only on a international scale but even on the national scale of well this is right and you must be wrong forces dividing rather than uniting and that's a real it's a real challenge to us, isn't it, as to how we respond, how we as God's people view these things. Because in one sense, our loyalties are not to this world. Our loyalties are to God. He is our sovereign. 
You know, you can't go around saying Jesus Christ is Lord, but only after we support Manchester United or, um, you know, the England cricket team or whatever. No, Jesus Christ is Lord. Our God is our King. That has to shape how we live our lives. And that's quite an interesting challenge for us in, in lots of ways. <laughs> um, because actually there are so many complicated things happening around us that our Bible forebears have been through. They've been through times of political uncertainty. They've been through plagues. They've been through conflicts. They've been through not knowing quite what, where they stood. And it's written in the Psalms and it's written in the Old Testament and the prophets and all of those. There's lessons for us to learn if we would but go and study. But let's move on to our, um, new, our gospel reading then from Mark. And what we get is actually, um, I think this is Mark's longest chapter, I think Mark 6, are two segments, one in the middle and one from the end. What happens in between? Well, that's quite interesting. What happens in between, amongst other things, is the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. Yeah, I know, you would have thought we would have had those rather than these two readings, but actually, these two, this, this reading here, of these two parts that make up this reading, are still very important. So the apostles, remember a couple of weeks ago, they were sent out. They were sent out to, to uh, with no, uh, with just a staff, with no second tunic, with just sandals, with no bread, with no money, to go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom to the people who were wanting to listen, who were willing to listen. And they return and they tell all that he had done, all that they had done, and their stories are full of miracles and healings and all of those kind of things. And Jesus has that care for them that says, come away with us. Come away and find some place to rest and recover because they're so busy, they haven't got time. And quite a lot of us know what that feeling's like, don't we? You know, we, 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 we're bombarded with, if we're, particularly if we're working from home, with emails and, oh, can you just do this? And can you just do that? And, oh, yeah, don't worry, you know, sometimes we need that rest. We need that time out of busyness to recuperate, to find ourselves, whether it's quiet days or whether it's kind of putting the answer phone on or whatever it is. We need those things. To, to, to restore who we are and I think that's a very interesting and, and uh, challenging thing for us to have but even so even when they go away then there are people turning up they get on a boat and they go across the, the, the lake and they go to the land of Gennesaret and Gennesaret is, a, is, is probably a pagan land in that sense you know, they farm pigs, don't they? Yeah, it's where the story about the man who was legion, yeah, with all those, who's possessed by all those demons that get sent in the pigs. That area is where they're going. And even there, the news of Jesus and his disciples has spread. And suddenly they're coming and bringing their uh, people who are poorly and seeking help and all of those things. They begged him that they might even touch the fringe of his cloak. What does that remind us of? A couple of weeks ago, the story of Jairus and his daughter and of the woman who had the, uh, had the menstrual bleed for 12 years. That story, she says, if only I could touch his cloak, touch his clothes. Here, it's even, it's even no, you don't have to touch all of his clothes, you just have to touch the tassels, just the, the, the hem, and you will be healed. Jesus is offering then of himself in a way that is going to be costly, but actually of course we know his offering of himself on the cross is the ultimate cost that he will give so that we might have fullness of health. People say often about Christianity, Oh, it's about reminding you that how sinful you are. There is a bit about that. But actually, we don't remind people how sinful they are without offering them absolution. Without saying, put aside those sins. They are forgiven. 
we can do that at the beginning of a service, can't we? You know, we confess our sins, we, for, we are forgiven our sins. And we move on. We are not burdened by our sins. Or at least we shouldn't be if we've sought forgiveness of God. We might still worry about the people we have sinned against. I think that's just a, as you know, that's a perfectly fine reaction. It's a perfectly human reaction to have. But actually, what, what our Christian faith does is call us into a situation where if we do make a mistake, we can be forgiven. We can reset ourselves and we can go again. We can serve the community again. And this is what is happening here. The disciples have served the community. They've healed. They've anointed with oil the sick. They've come back. They've tried to find rest and have found it. They've gone to a new place. And yet they're still being called. Even though they are just disciples. They're fishermen and tax collectors and ordinary folk like you and I. Still they're called on. But God gives them space and time like he gives us space and time as well and the forgiveness of sins comes as an important part of our faith we said earlier on about you know god is king in our lives jesus is lord so we are not tied to this world in that way we're not tied to our past either we have a way of through forgiveness and through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of setting ourselves free from our sins that we might live life and have live it in all its fullness as John says that too is very important can we in this coming week live life in its fullness in service we're not boasting here we're not just pushing our egos and saying how wonderful it is because being a Christian is tough sometimes it is hard how do we cope with all those difficult questions absolutely of why do evil people flourish and things like that but actually there is at the core of us something which is remarkably resilient which understands that we are forgiven we can reset we can go again but is also not about ego but about service not about this world, but about God. Living that out. Living out the kingdom. A tough call for us all. Amen. Our affirmation of faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our third hymn then comes from the um, contemporary American hymn writer Carl P. Dorr. As we gather at your table, and um, the traditional tune is Everton, well-known um, uh, Victorian hymn tune by Henry Smart. As we gather at your table, as we listen to your word, help us know, O oh God, your presence. Let our hearts and minds be stirred.
we come to our prayers for this week and particularly at this time as we look forward to um, being released from a lot of the lockdown restrictions we've got used to then there's a lot of challenges coming our way as particularly we're going to be thinking of those who've been um, diagnosed with COVID those who are wrestling with long COVID and how that affects them those perhaps who are been jabbed but are still worried about the future those who have no fear because probably they're under 25 and think they're immortal those kinds of things all play on up on our hearts don't they at this time when we think of our community and we pray for our community as we adjust to this new way of living that's not quite normal but sort of is and it's going to take us a bit of time to get used to it let us pray let us pray to the lord lord have mercy for the peace that comes from god alone for the unity of all peoples and for our salvation let us pray to the lord lord have mercy for the church of christ for richard richard our bishop for derek and fiona our archdeacons for sarah to be the new dean of hereford cathedral for the church and for our response to this new way of living as we work out how it is to worship and work in a new community in a new way we pray for the power of the holy spirit to come into our hearts to guide us and help us as we pray for ourselves and the whole people of god let us pray to the lord lord have mercy for the nations of the world for those particularly net particular nations where climate change has caused um, heat waves and droughts pray for pray for the um, western half of the united states and that part of canada caught up in the heat wave pray too for other countries where temperatures are above normal particularly in parts of russia and those fighting forest fires there Pray for our planet that is sending us warning signals. That we may be in, we may be in tune with those and change our lives to live more in cooperation with the planet rather than exploitation. So we pray for the leaders of the nations that they may have the wisdom and the foresight to use aright the gifts they've been given by God to make the world a better place for all people. Pray also for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the royal family, and for those in authority, national government, our local governments, and our parish councillors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this village where we live, for our neighbours and our friends, for that sense of belonging together that we might find as community groups start to reform everything from community cafes to uh, WI to mothers unions whatever it may be as we gather together once again so we pray that we may renew those bonds which link us together and strengthen us as God's community in this place so for our, for our friends, our families, our neighbours, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and the infirm, for the widowed and orphaned, for the sick and the suffering. For those in our hospitals and those in our care homes, for those worried about tests and operations, for those seeking relief from pain, for those who worry and are anxious, for those who are lost and alone. And for all in any kind of need, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them. 
especially for those who are involved in retail at this time, or hospitality, with the changes and challenges that are coming, for those worried about their jobs and the company they work for, for those who are self-employed. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all the people and places that are on our hearts, for the stories in the news that have touched us, for the goodness of humanity, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the dying, and for those who mourn the death of those close to them. For the faithful, whom we entrust to the Lord in hope, as we look forward to the day when we shall share the fullness of the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to God. For yours is the majesty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Our collect for this week, then, the seventh Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, then, with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to the peace. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you and all those in your household today. We close our uh, worship with a blessing in a moment, but first to him, and um, it's one who's wonderful. You know, I mean, we might complain sometimes about Victorian hymn writers being a bit soppy, but not this one. Uh, this is Samuel Stone's The Church Has One Foundation, um, to the um, tune by um, Samuel Sebastian Wesley of Aurelia. Um, it's just a lovely hymn, upbeat, powerful, sends us out in the right mood as we go to face um, the challenges of this coming week. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. We are a new creation by water and the word. The church's one foundation. <laughs>
our closing blessing then as we come to the end of this service. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you for being part of our worship today and I do hope you had enjoyed the series of videos. Um, as I say, we'll continue to make them um, into August, uh, then we've got a bit of holiday and then come September we'll kind of determine uh, where we want to go. But if you appreciate those, these um, worship, these here, the services and you value them, please let me know. Um, it's, uh, you can always just put a comment on the YouTube channel or just send us a link via uh, a comment via um, the Wormlow 100 Facebook page um, or just email me directly. Uh, do take care. Look after one another and yourselves and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. <music>